Hey everybody, welcome to Everyday Asphalt. We are glad you are here. The purpose of this program is to go a little bit deeper in the areas of materials, design, construction, and maintenance. Just to let everybody know that all these programs that we produce are on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, type in TechSampa, uh, you will see that we've got a playlist right there on the front page for Everyday Asphalt. Uh, please remember to like, subscribe, and share this information. As we talked about last month, we are going on the road this year, and this year we are on the road again, but we're not going too far. We've gone all the way across the parking lot of Texap, and we are in the HMAC building where all the certification and all the training and certification happens, and uh, we've commandeered the podcast room for today's, uh, today's presentation. So, and uh, just also to let you know, brand new for 2024, all these programs are going to be audible cast, and not on Audible, but, but on Spotify or on your favorite listening thing, uh, program, so you can listen to them as you drive. I, I do that pretty much every day. I'm always listening to a podcast of something or another. So, all right, let's get to work. Our topic today is materials and mix design. Our guest today is Bill Pine. He's the QC Director of Asphalt Technology with Heritage Construction Materials. Welcome to Everyday Asphalt. Thank you, Jim. I'm glad to be here. You know, Bill's a pretty humble guy, um, but in a, in, and the, the company that he works for, Heritage, has got some pretty awesome people in that. And, and I think that the thing that's important to understand, that even though Bill's not from Texas, um, the stuff that they do at Heritage touches us nationally because there's a lot of stuff that's going on nationally that impacts Texas, super pave and binders and everything else and balance mix design we're going to talk a little bit about everything goes through there so um, there's some really cool stuff happening in that and Bill's been all involved in that so Bill um, give us a little bit of background on yourself kind of how you got into the business what your background is how did you get started got a civil engineering degree okay. just a BS degree right. um, started to work for the Illinois Department of Transportation in 1985 spent uh, a year out on construction, okay. uh, came back and, and that winter had the opportunity to uh, transfer into the materials okay. uh, bureau in, in there at the district office and thought, I don't really know much about materials, but it's about three miles from my house and I'm already going out on construction. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Uh, spent about, about 14 years with the Illinois Department of Transportation, most of that working in the bureau materials. Uh, virtually in all of, in Paris, oh, Illinois, in, Paris. Okay. in yep, District Five, okay. and most of that time was spent working for Mr. Bailey, who the Bailey Methods okay. named after. Okay. Uh, had an opportunity at the end of '98 uh, to go to work for the Heritage Group, specifically Heritage Research, mm -hmm. and thought it was a chance I couldn't pass up, oh, and that sure. was 25 years ago. Wow! So yeah, you're saying 25 years ago this week? Yep. Well, congratulations. That's a Thank that's you. a big accomplishment. So, tell us a little bit about what all here because this is important for everybody to understand. He's not a researcher. This is he's involved in a lot of different stuff. But tell us what kind of the heritage company is involved in. The heritage group is a, is a a large group of companies, north of thirty different companies that are all family owned by wow. the Faisenfeld family. Okay. Um, the portion that I work for is considered Heritage Construction and Materials, which has a uh, contractor division, which does both uh, concrete and hot mix work, okay. uh, has a group of aggregate quarries and pits, uh, another company, Asphalt Materials, that designs polymer modified emulsions, provides neat asphalt okay. cement and, and modified binders. Heritage Research is the research arm of those three companies. So you're totally integrated with a full research arm. Yep. So there's not too many of those yep. in the country at, at all. I mean, not many. Maybe, yeah. Just maybe, just barely a few of those. Okay. Well, good deal. Um, and again, you, you're QC director. I am. And uh, of uh, and how much how much tonnage do you guys make a year? About four million ton, a little over that. How yep. many asphalt plants? Any idea? Uh, north of fifteen. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how do you handle? Kind of the whole mixed design because you're multi-state as well how do you handle that along across state lines all your qc people how does that how does that look 
today Other than maybe a little bit of chaotic it, it can be um, it can be because normally our QC managers don't call me when they're having a great day rarely they call me when they're having a problem <laughs> um, but but they do a great job uh, across the company of producing quality mix and placing quality mix I'm there to help them when problems arise at the plant, in the design, okay. under production. Okay. So you're, the, you're a resource for them. I am. At okay. the same time, I work in concert with Heritage Research on different research projects that we've got involved with. Uh, that Some of them are internal. Some of them are external. We do mm -hmm. work with NCAT, with mm -hmm. University of Nevada, Reno, sure. with the University of Illinois. Because you partner on NCHRP projects right. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Well, good deal. Well, Bill is here this week at Texampa. He is. Uh, this is the second time, second year he's been here. He is teaching the Bailey Method class, and this is an advanced technique that looks at aggregates and and how they pack together and and how all that's associated with mix design. So, um, and it's f f super interesting. And uh, uh, so, Bill, what is the Bailey Method? It, Who developed it? And, and how did you become the, the, the teacher, the, <laughs> uh, Jedi, the Jedi? Who, who developed it was a guy by the name of Bob Bailey, okay. who spent his entire career with the Bureau of Materials there at IDOT in District 5 okay. in Paris, Illinois. Uh, really, the first two-thirds of Bob's career was spent dealing with the concrete or the interstate construction era mm -hmm. in Illinois, which was pretty much either jointed reinforced concrete pavement or continuously reinforced concrete. Right. Right. The last third of his career really was when Illinois started doing what we would call first generation overlays okay. on those concrete pavements. Gotcha. Uh, like a lot of other states, they were designing 50 blow Marshall mixes with 2% yep. air voids, and they didn't work so well. No. no. So Bob kind of got tasked with from a district perspective of figuring out how do we fix rutting. And so you worked with Bob. I worked with Bob, yep, when I started in 86. How cool was that? Did you know then where I had no you would idea. be? Yeah, yeah, where you'd be now. I had no idea. Okay. So how did you become the teacher of it? I suppose Bob, I, I left. You, were, you became the mentor, right? Yeah, I did. Um, Bob retired from IDOT at the end of 97, 1997. Okay. I left at the end of 1998, and, and the, Heritage, the Heritage Group had a whole lot of interest in the Bailey Method, knew of it, but wanted to learn more, wanted to know how can you help, okay. you know, how I could help our asphalt companies. Gotcha. Um, and it really grew from that, and, and, and I have to give a, a thank you to Charles Potts, as mm -hmm. I was telling you earlier, yeah. uh, when, Great guy. when I had the opportunity after double APT, uh, the conference in Lexington in 2003, I had the opportunity to go meet with the Asphalt Institute engineers afterwards. And Another great group. Folks. Yep, yep. And present the Bailey Method to them, and they're like, this is awesome. <laughs> Would you come teach it? Sure. And I'm like, yeah, let me see. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and Charles was the person who stood up in our group and said, we think this is a good thing for the industry. Okay. If it's a good thing for the industry, it's a good thing for the Heritage Group. Let Bill teach it. Awesome. Awesome. So why are you a believer in it? Because I've used it since 1986. I've used it in mixed designs. I've used it in production applications. Okay. Uh, I know it works. I know it's a great tool. There's okay. a lot of people view it as theory, but it's started, I'll say, his theory with a lot of work that Bob did mm -hmm. in the lab at yeah. District 5, um, but it's been put into practice, it's evolved, and, and we know the principles that we So you've teach, taken it and you've work. kind of evolved it a little bit as well in, yes. the, in the process? Yes, and especially from a mathematical standpoint. Okay. Today, we, we can do a great job of estimating VMA and air voids between mixed trials, between before we make a production change. Right. Uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners have had uh, seen mixed changes made under production that went the opposite direction they were intended to go. And you were talking about that today. Yeah, yeah it's so a great we're, we're, I mean, we're taking a break between finished class today, so we're in the studio here taping this. So, you know, just listening to the audience today, and, I, and, and, I, and you, were, you called out and said, hey, give me a, what's your target VMA, what's your target air voids, and then you, you, went, you did some math and you say, your asphalt content was going to be 5.1. And the guy goes, 
Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you've done the math, you've done the science behind all this, and so I really think there's something something there. So let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper. What are the key principles behind the Bailey Method? It, it really all starts by defining mixed type, okay. at, really as a function of coarse aggregate volume. Okay. So we, if, when the Bailey Method started, uh, it was very much focused on coarse graded mixes okay. uh, to help solve a rutting problem in Illinois, but understand uh, that then, back in the early 1980s, manufactured sand from quarries was a waste product. Right. We right. were using crushed coarse aggregates and round natural sands. So that that played a big role in eroding susceptibility of those mixes. Sure, sure. You know, so Bob's initial answer... You put ball bearings in, yeah, in pavements, right. ...was get more of the angular coarse aggregate in there. That'll help arrest the running. It did, but we've learned since then. We've learned we have manufactured sand products available to us that now we can apply that not just from a coarse graded aspect, we can design a good aggregate structure for a fine graded mix. Yeah, I mean, for you, any given traffic application. I mean, today you were talking about fine graded mixes, coarse graded mixes, SMA mixes. SMA, yeah. Um, they've got different kind of tweaks to it. Yeah. But the, the kind of the principles behind it. And, I, uh, and so that's, that's really interesting. So you're looking at the aggregate and you're looking at how the aggregate kind of packs together, for lack of a better right. word. Right. No, it's a very good and, word uh, um, And I, it really seems to me that you're, you know, as, as one who taught mix design many, many years ago, and as we were talking about earlier, I knew nothing about this. And I remember, like, okay, get your aggregates, they got to be consensus properties, and let's go blend. And you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And it almost reminds me of kind of... Ever the movie? There's an old old movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man, where he kind of you know, and, he, and he's looking at stuff from um, basically kind of inside out, and we're just kind of looking. Hey, there's a pile of rock. There's a pile of rock. But you're actually getting in between the rock, and you're looking at how those voids are distributed, the size of the voids, uh, and that, all that kind of stuff. And it's it initially it seems a little bit daunting, but when you start thinking about it. It makes a lot of sense. It's it's I I describe it as a systematical way okay. to look at an aggregate blend, and at first glance it can seem complicated. Mm -hmm. But as you get into it, it can help you see the complexities that are there. Most people don't recognize yeah. in aggregate blends. Yeah, that that's kind of again sitting through it this year. I'm kind of going, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I get that. You go this way and you go that way and you're like up and down. It's like okay, that starts to make a lot more sense to me. How come people haven't really looked at this before? I mean, I mean, I, I look at people kind of doing designs. And I think everybody's kind of doing something a little bit different trying to get there. But this is really important. It is. I've taught well over 100 of these classes wow. over the years. Um, many at the Asphalt Institute, other at locations mm -hmm. like yours, and, and most of that have been to contractors. There have been agencies, there have been consultants. Mm -hmm. um, the last count I had, we were at, at the Institute at 48 or 49 of the 50 states. Okay. I've been to the class, okay. uh, I would guess, at least a dozen different countries. Okay, wow. Um, you and I know the contracting side of the industry. Yep. We know, and, and we are contractors, mm -hmm. when we find something that's an advantage, it's generally not time to pick the phone up and call our competitors yeah, and go, hey, do you know gonna about hold, this? You're going to hold those cards <laughs> pretty close. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of contractors that use the Bailey method at least to some degree. That are talking about that's it. That's right. Okay. Well, because that makes a lot of sense. it's helpful for them, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You stress the importance of the aggregate shape. Yep. Now we talk about you know consensus properties of Los Angeles abrasion, soundness, acid insolubility, you know all that sort of stuff, and 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 the gradation, the material, specific gravity, those kind of things. But we don't. I think normally we don't really think about shape. You got to have so many crushed faces and that and that sort of stuff. And we talk about you know crushed material is stronger than rounded material. That, but you're really looking at 
the shape of that material and the shape of the different fractions of the material in the gradation. Um, can you explain that just a little bit? Yeah, I, I think if you've got listeners that have some knowledge of SMA, mm -hmm. they, un, they, they know particle shape sure. of the coarse aggregate right. in SMA, right. you know, lack of flat and elongated, more cubical particles mm -hmm. is crucial. Um, we got to transfer that same thought onto thinking about the coarse fractions and the fine fractions in our dense graded mixes mm -hmm. just as well. Okay. Okay. okay, and understand the role of particle shape and, and it, how it plays a, a vital part in being able to compact or consolidate an aggregate blend. Which makes a lot of sense, yeah. you know, both in the lab and also in the field. In the field. I know we've got some actually some field folks in, in our class now, and, and you're talking through that. It's like, well, how does this mix compact? And they go, well, pretty good or not pretty good, depending on, on what's going on with it. So... Um, good deal. So, what lab equipment do I need to run the Bailey? A unit weight bucket, typically okay. a quarter of a cubic foot. Okay. Um, a 5 8 inch diameter steel rod that's normally 24 inches long, and a 30th of a cubic foot or 4 inch diameter proctor mold. That's it. So, no high tech, no VFDs and all that sort of stuff that's, you know, we're talking a couple hundred bucks worth of stuff I just ordered a set for here. Um, and so you're going to take those aggregates and you're going to do what test with them in the buckets? We're going to run unit weight tests on each individual virgin aggregate okay. and use those points as a loose unit weight condition and also a rotted weight condition as reference points. So you're finding out in the bucket itself where the, the aggregate is just basically just very placed in there what the total void condition is. Right. And then in a, basically we're going to try to compact it and, and see what happens uh, in that process of how that material is going to start to kind of hold itself into a tighter mass. Right. But then the, what I've been getting out of this is then that void structure in between there then we look at some of the other tests to figure out what we can place to put in between there to, to maximize the deficiency of the materials, but still get a good quality, good quality mix in the same process. Yep, and, okay. and that's really the first step in determining mix type. Knowing where we're at with core sag volume and the voids we've got to fill or intentionally overfill, okay right drives us to this as a coarse graded mix a fine graded mix or sma okay cool hang on just a second okay so that's what's going on with this whole program right and uh so i, I wanted to spend a little bit of time because you spent a lot of time today talking about um vma and air voids and and what the importance of all those is who's driving the bus there on vma and air voids i know you talked about it today VMA is driving the bus, hands down. Yeah. And air voids follow VMA like a puppy dog follows you in the backyard. <laughs> and I know one of the things that, that Texas does is, and, and you've been vocal about it, is, is Texas doesn't calculate the VMA that the standard would be kind of the standard way of doing that because VMA requires aggregate specific gravities in order to do that, and it's always been a challenge. I remember in my old job, it was, well, what number do you use? And it can, be, it, became, it can become kind of onerous in some areas. And I know you work in multiple states and have worked a lot of different places. A lot of people are doing a lot of different things, trying to figure out what that bulk specific, what that gravity is we're gonna use for the material, yeah. or are we gonna use a surrogate number or how are we going to handle, you know, is it, a, is it a, a yearly number or a monthly number or how does it change? And So there's a lot of aspects with that. Texas has gone kind of a simplistic approach. And when you do that, you're taking a little bit of risk in, in there. And they don't account for the asphalt that's absorbed into uh, the aggregate. Right. And so that, that's a little bit of a challenge. But I think what the way you're teaching the class is... You still got to meet the specification. Yep. But it doesn't preclude you from really looking at VMA the way VMA was intended to be looked at and, and, and how that functions 
as these aggregate particles pack together. Is that a reasonable? It, it does, yep. Um, VMA probably throughout its history um, has been a controversial subject, yes. right? <laughs> and, and, and all yeah, about absolutely. You know, how accurate is that combined mm -hmm. blend GSB. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, you can have struggles depending on the state you're in right. um, as to whether or not VMA really does relate to durability. Yeah. But, but I'll tell you where we are today, where we're headed as an industry with balanced mixed design tests. Mm -hmm. I, I believe those tests are very much driven by volume of effective asphalt, okay. by properties of the asphalt, which would include both virgin asphalt and any recycled asphalt okay. mix. Okay. So I, I think it's more important for our industry than ever to, to have as clear a picture on volume of effective asphalt. VMA, volume of effective asphalt okay. is air vo VMA minus air voids. Right. Right. So we, right. we know how to calculate air voids, but to calculate VMA, we got to have an accurate GSB. Okay. Okay. And that's the challenge. It is. And that's the challenge. Yeah. But there's a couple things I want to make clear. One, I get it. Some sources are variable mm -hmm. in GSB, and, and that can be challenging for the industry when they deal with those sources. Mm -hmm. I'm, all, I'm all on board that what we've used historically for what's the right VMA, what's the right air void. Mm -hmm may not be where we need to be to really take performance of our mixes to the next step where we're trying to go with BMD. Gotcha, gotcha. But, but I believe it's more important for our contractors than ever to know so they can differentiate between aggregate sources, between plants. Okay. Why does the mix over there take six tenths more asphalt than this mix? A QC manager is going to have to answer for that to their owner. Yeah, the owner is good. Right? Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of money. And why is this, why, and I think what the things that you're talking about today is, is why is this mix performing differently than this other mix is? And I think by looking at, looking at it uh, in a little bit more detail, I think we can start uh, to figure that out. Yep. And I, and I think to me what, what this, what this, what this method does is Provide some more tools in the toolbox for the contractor as they're as they're making the mix, as they're adjusting the mix, as they're troubleshooting the mix. Um, even during production, I mean, you, you you had a great discussion going on today with some folks on that. Is is how you you know what do you do? You know what do you do when this happens? What do you do when VMA collapses? What do you do when when this is? And and in some some cases, the, the number makes sense. In some cases. It doesn't, but there's always an answer to it. Yep. And I think that's the important thing is, is there is an answer out there for, for these things. So, um, so, and we was talking to somebody earlier today, and, we, and I said, we're teaching the Bailey course, Bailey method upstairs. He goes, yeah, I went to that years and years and years ago. And he goes, it's just about coarse graded mixes. <laughs> so explain that one more time that, it's, that it can be used for others and, and, and a little bit about why. Or how it, it started with coarse graded yep. mixes, yep, no doubt. But it's definitely evolved. Uh, we can apply the principles to fine graded mixes to SMA mixes, and teach all three. And I, I do my best today, I guess, to help understand, help people understand how the method applies mm -hmm. to each of those mix types, gotcha. and and how do they make a choice of what's the right mix type for the situation we're putting it in. Gotcha. And, and right can be defined a lot of ways, right? Right yeah. in terms of cost, in terms of quality, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what can I achieve with the aggregates I have available to me. Right, gotcha, gotcha. So what else does, I mean, again, we're, we're just kind of touching the surface on this and people are gonna go, what? From, a, from, a, from, a, from what we're doing today, what else am, are we missing to talk about the Bailey Method from that perspective? One, I think it would be good to, to make sh clear to your listeners, it's not a specification, it's a tool. Okay. okay. And, and it can be used to help contractors design better mixes within okay. a given set of specifications. It's not a mixed design method, it's, right. a, it's, a, it's a tool. Right. It okay. can be used with the Veeam method, the Marshall method, the SuperPave method, the Warren method. Done. <laughs> yeah. It's about understanding aggregate packing relative to that type and amount of compactive effort. Okay. Um, so it, it, don't make it a specification. 
right. but find ways to allow your contractors to use it okay. to design better mixes. All right, that's a good deal, good deal. Um, one of the things we, we talked about earlier was, was you were discussing some, some data, some real, real, real world stuff about, and we're kind of switching a little bit about mixed performance a little bit now, um, about the relationship between density and mixed strength. Explain that a little bit, because you were talking about some some values where you're seeing different density values, and you're actually just seeing different modulus values based yeah. on some of your research that you've seen. Yeah, the work that the Indiana Department of Transportation and Purdue University have, has done, and, and we participated in much of that in the development of what's now called Super Pay 5 in mm -hmm. Indiana, okay. that I think is starting to to gain traction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you hear it. I mean, I deal with some national stuff. Can you just quickly explain? Yeah, Super Pay 5 is, is basically designing at 1% higher than normal VMA, but also choosing optimum asphalt at 5% air voids instead of 4. So okay. really volume of effective asphalt doesn't change. But what really altered our blends with Super Pay 5 is we dropped in design from 100 gyrations to 50 okay. for one category yeah. and from 75 to 30 for okay. another category. Right. And, and today, Indiana DOT would tell you they're consistently seeing 5% in place air voids. So you're, you're designing at 5 and you're compacting to 5. Yes. So, I mean, you go way back, you design at 4 and you'd compact to, to seven. Nine, 7 or 8 and right. assume that over time there was going to be some additional densification. You're saying, hey, we've got the structure, we're going to build it the way we want it, and day one, we're going to have it at that level. Yep. Which is a, that's a kind of a different philosophy for old guys, you know, if you're kind of, if you've been around a while. So yeah. It's and interesting. I mean, it makes sense, though. Yeah. You're assuming that you've got a, you've got a, you've got such a structure that isn't going to further densify. It's going to lock itself out, right? And so right. it's, it's done everything it's going to do. So that, that higher density, not only results in higher strength, it also re results in lower permeability for both air and water. And that's a big deal as well. One of the very first projects that, that our company did as a pilot project for Super Pay 5 that's, uh, I want to say, in the seven or eight years old range now, mm -hmm. uh, was cored just in the last year, year and a half. Control section, Super Pay 5 section, binder extracted, recovered, okay. graded, yeah. and the super pay five section that was at a higher density, lower permeability, mm -hmm. graded out a full grade lower on both high and low temperature properties. Wow, so from a maintenance perspective, and, and, and we've talked about this a lot, we've talked about it in, in a bunch of different areas. Uh, we've got maintenance out here, I think, that are gonna be starting vacuum here, so we're gonna have to <laughs> go close the door. But, um, uh, this is a this is a key point on maintenance that if we build these things right and we compact them to the right level of density, we're not going to see that aging of that binder that's going to lead to block cracking and oxidative aging and permeability and that kind of stuff. That's a win-win. Yes. But we've got to we've got to figure out a way of getting that structure set up where we can get that higher level. So we were talking about kind of this this. This issue of getting the right level of density in the mixes and uh, what that does for us. It gives us more strength, right? But it's also going to lock that mix up and make it impermeable. And permeability is a problem, right? I mean, if we, if we allow too much water and air in these mixes, they're going to age prematurely. They're going to be a maintenance problem. So by, by just looking at that from that perspective, from a design perspective, Okay, that higher modulus has helped us carry the load. We get heavier and heavier loads. From a maintenance perspective, if we get that asphalt, if we get the asphalt in there that we need, and then we seal it in there, it's going to perform like it needs to perform by allowing that that load transfer to occur and not see this uh, a, a big oxidative change, which then can re result in cracking, raveling, you know, all that sort of distress that we don't want. So I think that's a really important thing that, that as we're looking at these mixes and as, you know, a lot of you folks are engineers and we're, we're, we're maybe sometimes have to evaluate materials and that kind of stuff. This is the why <laughs> this is important, okay? And why density is important. And this is the why because it's, it's longevity. 
we got to get the mix compacted bow. And, and, and the neat thing about Texas's specifications is the dense graded, the super paved, the SMAs, they all have a bonus for getting, and the max of bonus is right, right in that, where that magic number is where you talked about, right in that five, you know, four to six percent range. That's kind of the maximum bonus. So there's incentive there for, your, for, for a contractor to go get that. And uh, the DOT pay gets gets return on that investment of anything that they pay out. They're going to get uh, they're going to get that back right. in in longer life. Extended payment, payment life, yeah. absolutely. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, let's talk a couple minutes about balance mix design, okay? And that's coming. I mean, you guys know we've we've had we've had folks on. We've had Amy Epps on. Uh, last year, and we've talked about balance, the Balanced Mix Design Initiative in Texas and everything that's going on with that. Now, you guys are working on it, and everybody's working on it in the, in the other states. And so I'm just curious, from your perspective, um, kind of, you know, where we're at now and, and where we might be going, what would your vision, what should BMD look like? when we get done. I mean, we're going to have to go through all the efforts and it's going to get a little ugly in specification development. But when we get done, from your perspective, what should it look like? From an agency's point of yeah, view. Yeah. From an agency's point of view, it, it should be much more focused on the properties of the balanced mixed design test okay. and less focused on what we've considered necessary properties in the past. A fixed asphalt content relative to a design, okay. a, a certain okay. VMA or okay. a certain air void. Method, more method spec yeah. sort of stuff. But I, I believe that's the agency side of the fence. They can back away from those requirements. They have confidence that this test says it won't rut, this test says it won't crack. Mm -hmm. Then then they need to give the contractors the ability they to can, innovate. They can relax a little bit, say right. my risk is down. Okay, now you take care of it. You know more about the materials than we do. Right, and that that whole shift has occurred, um, and 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 I think, I think, you know, there, I don't know who came up with the different levels, of 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 balanced mix design from, you know, the first level I think is do what you're doing now and then add this stuff to it. Right, that's and then, method A. And what's what's method B? Method B is basically you can adjust asphalt content. Okay. Relative to what the original optimum was. Okay. If you need a little bit more asphalt to make cracking resistance better, but still have acceptable rutting, okay. or vice versa. Okay. And then C. C allows you to deviate some from the volumetric properties okay. that have been okay. considered acceptable in the past. Okay. And D is basically we don't look at volumetric properties. Just give me rutting, rutting and, and cracking. Cracking resistance. Right. Okay. So, you think we're gonna get there? I think so. Okay. I, I do. I but I think it's going to take efforts from both the industry oh, and the agencies. For sure. For but sure. We, it's it's hard, and I've been there. I spent 14 years with IDOT. It's hard to let go. Yes. yes. And say, okay, yeah. I trust these tests. Yeah. I'm not going to trust what I've used historically to qualify it as a good mix or a bad mm -hmm. mix. I also think it's going to take more effort and more knowledge from our industry than ever before. Makes sense. To know how to, do we make these materials work, right? Yeah. There, we're going to have to know more about wrap yeah. than we ever did before yeah. in terms of the binder properties that are there. We're going to have to learn more about rejuvenating agents. You know, what advantage is warm mix yeah. or an additive to this mix in bringing temperature down, aging it less, improving the cracking resistance without destroying the running side of things. So our industry... I think it's going to have to go quite a bit beyond where we are today okay. to ensure that we can design mixes to meet those running well, and cracking that makes results. Sense. That makes sense. I mean, you've got to be able to, to know your... I mean, if you want to try something, if I want to put these in asphalt, well, i got to know what the impact of this is on it. And I think that's right. one of the things that we've always kind of talked about in, 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 in the different jobs I've had is... is is somebody's got a magic new something that they want to put in the asphalt, is it going to work? And then we also have to, and I think the other thing that we have to look at things now is, 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 the, is kind of the environmental side. Is, 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 is 
do they improve sustainability? Um, do they potentially, you know, cr take somebody else's problem and make it our problem? You know, because they're getting rid of their waste <laughs> and asking us to take their waste yeah. product and put it in us. Is 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 that become then a problem for us long term down the road? So these are all things that that have got to be done uh, and analyzed. So we're, we're really looking at a different. You know, we're in our 60s, and you know, we're not going to last forever. But, you know, as, as, as folks come behind us, there's a really kind of a cool time ahead. Mm -hmm. Isn't there? I mean, it there just is. seems like there's a, yep. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's great opportunities uh, moving ahead with this stuff. And there's, there's just a, it's just a, a fascinating time to be in the asphalt industry. I, I think it's going to look way different 10 years from now than it does today. Wow. I think we're going to be amazed at what we know. I do think, as engineers, yeah. um, we sometimes work too hard to get a R squared value of 0.986, and and I think that's kind of some of the problem that people have struggled with in these balanced mixed design tests, are seeing a clear relationship between test results and performance in the field. That, that takes an effort, I believe, from both the agency, the owner, and the contractor to really understand that pavement structure, not just the new yeah. mix on top, on how that influenced performance over well, a period absolutely. of time. Well, absolutely. I mean, we, we've talked about that a lot, about, you know, the, the, the pavement is much more than just what's on top. Right. It's the whole thing and how all that system works together. But I think, you know, this to me kind of, if I can then really understand my mix better than when I get into like a long life or perpetual pavement where I'm really looking for different properties of the mix in different layers as that load is being transmitted through it. It gives me more knowledge to be able to design a, a base mix, a intermediate, a surface mix appropriately with the materials I've got to carry the load, transmit the load and, and, and create you know the pavement structure that I'm looking for, and as I'm distributing that load down, so I just think it's, a, it's just a it's a really kind of a cool time. So it, it's a, it's a good deal. It's a good deal. Um, so what do the contractors need to do right now? Take a Bailey Method class. That's probably a good place to start. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll have another one next year, yeah. or maybe if there's um, a big on it, well, a big interest. Let us know. Maybe. We, We'll get Bill back. Con contractors need, number one, to get their head around balanced mixed design. Okay. You know, um, obviously, talk. TextDot has tests they're already using. Are yeah. there other tests they're we're, considering? We talk about it at almost every meeting. Yeah, now, so. And, and so, and we're doing it with yeah. our mixes in Indiana. We're benchmarking our mixes now. And I think that's a key thing is, is, is figure out where you're at. Right. I mean, don't run off and start something new because um, what you got at least from what we've heard from a, a, a couple of people, is um, that you may be fairly close. Yes. But you may need to make some tweaks to it. You don't have to throw the whole thing out and go, oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta do a BMD. It's, you know, it's purple asphalt. No, it's gonna be the same. You're gonna use the same materials. You may be able to use some different materials. But I think it, it's just a matter of getting getting a hold of that a little bit better. But but benchmarking is. And that's come up from, from TTI, talking to us at meetings about start to figure out where you're at. And that's a good, obviously it's a good position. And that's much easier said than done because the, our, our, those contractors, just like us, yeah. need to understand when you're going to do that benchmarking, we got to take sampling of the mix very seriously. We oh, got to get a good representative sample. Yep. We got to talk about how it's going to be handled when those samples are going to be made relative mm -hmm. to when the sample was taken, when the samples are going to be tested relative to when they were made. Because that can, from what I understand, that can have a really big influence right. on the test result right. with some of these, these new tests. So, yeah. you know, and that's part, I think, what we're trying to do right now in Texas with the next effort with BMD of the projects that are going to be built uh, this year and next year is, is go out there and just Let's do this on a day-to-day, -day, you know, day in. Let's do it for multiple days and see how this thing works and how we're going to be able to make these samples, how we're going to handle them, how we're going to, you know, get the oven space and, and when we're going to do what testing, what's going to get shipped off, 
you know, and start understanding the variability and being able to uh, identify and, and tie down some of these te test methods a little bit, say, you know, you sample it this way, you, you know, it's got to be, you know, oven, you know, conditioned a certain period of time. There's, there may be a duration between the curing and the molding and the testing and, and all that. Um, I think that's part of what that's part of what TTI and and, and Textile has been working on is going to be working on is, is trying to sort that out. So I know the Epses, John and and uh, Amy, are, are are all in on that and trying to work work some of that stuff out. So so for the future. So awesome, awesome. So we need to kind of start wrapping up. This doesn't go on forever, Ben. We Bill, we really appreciate you being here. But I just kind of got last couple three questions. I, I try to ask pretty much everybody. What's the hardest part of your job? Uh, keeping everybody happy at the same time. Um, <laughs> pro, you know, Amen it, to that. We don't, yeah. we don't see it very often, but I think one of the most technical challenging problems to fix is when you have a tender mix show up during production, tender mix that, that wants to have a bow wave in front of yeah. the roller, doesn't want to sit still. Yep. Whenever you have a tender mix, two things always happen. You struggle with density, you struggle with smoothness. Mm -hmm. um, rarely is it one thing that's causing tenderness in that mix. Okay. There's about four or five stars that have aligned that day, and you got to figure out what stars they are and what you need to remove to get oh, okay. mix stability back. I that's got you. I got probably you. one of the most challenging things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So even with coarse graded mixes, you're running the tenderness. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I've seen it on SMA. We've Really? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, interesting. Interesting. All right. Next question. What does quality mean to you? Basically providing the customer a product that, that absolutely meets and preferably exceeds their expectations. Okay. 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 It's a good definition. It's a good definition. Um, as an example, I'll yeah. give you the, when we last paved the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, that was done in 2004. Yep. Real quickly, the first time the entire oval was paved all at once was 1976. Yeah. The second time, 1988. The third time, 1995. And the last time, 2004. Okay. So if you do the math, they were getting around nine years okay. before they had to resurface it on average. Okay. In 2004, our goal was to get 15 years, which was in 2019. The same mix is still there today. Okay. With the beginning of 2024. So you stepped up. We, as the Heritage Group, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Do you use the Bailey method? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but but a lot of people put a lot of effort into it. Oh, and that's a great example. Absolutely. I think you know the situation where it exceeded what they were expecting as well as us. Yeah, I think I think when you get into those specialty projects, I know there's you know been you know several here. Um, got Coda right right here in Austin. Uh, that was a when they built that. That was a huge undertaking, um, and and they have those folks have very. You think a DOT spec is hard? They have very stringent requirements on skid and surface texture and and you know they're measuring straight edging with a micrometer underneath it. I mean mm -hmm. they're really looking at at things. But when you're going. 200 and plus miles an hour, a little bump is going to take you a long way. So yeah. I, I understand that. Um, I remember when they repaved uh, um, uh, Daytona. I was uh, able to go out on on that. I remember the last race that they had before that. They had, they had pavement failures. They actually had to stop the race, and they were trying to patch the pavement because they had just gone too far. Um, and, and then they went in and did it. And it was a, a monumental effort. To repave those pavements, it's thirty-one degree banking yep. and all that sort of stuff. It's it's crazy. So, all right, last question. Uh, ask this, everybody. Uh, king for the day. You get to change anything. What is it and why? T today, uh, I, I was there with IDOT when we switched from method specifications to QCQA. Okay. And what I've seen happen in Illinois, I've seen it happen in Indiana, and I, and I know it's happening in other states. When, as the agency transferred the responsibility to the contractor to design the mix, 
to calibrate the asphalt plant and operate the plant, right. uh, proportion the mix, right. set up the rolling patterns, test the mix. It's all yours. It's yep. all theirs. Yeah. What went with that was a lot of knowledge over time. Today, yeah. we have a lot of young engineers who've never had the opportunity to design an asphalt mix that actually got used on a job from an agency perspective. Sure, sure. You sure. know, and, and they don't, there's a lot of things that their job today doesn't allow them to learn like it did me from 1986 to the end of 98. Of it. Right. That's right. 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 So, so if I could change something, it would be to get us as the state asphalt pavement associations and the owners working more closely together on an education program okay. for both the industry and the agency. Good. I think I think that's real reasonable. I mean, I, I, I mean I've seen the shift over the years too, and and. Uh, you know, we've got, you know, young TxDOT engineers, consulting consultants that work for, you know, that work on behalf of TxDOT now, and, and, and they're having to look at test data. They're looking at, you know, their project engineers or area engineers, assistant area engineers, and they're looking at, at information and they're saying, hey, what do I do with this? What does it mean? Right. And we talk all the time, but what is the, what does the binder test mean? What does the mix test mean? So I think uh, that's, a, that's a really good, uh, I need to take that to heart. And, we talk about how to do that. So, um, well, that's all the time we've got today, uh, folks. I'd like to thank uh, thank you guys for for, for dialing in, and uh, just to remember that these programs are put up on our YouTube site. So go to YouTube, type in Texapa or Texas Asphalt Pavement Association, and look us up there. Um, we've got a wealth of information on our website, TexasAsphalt.org. Go in there, click on the resources resources button. And a lot of stuff in there. I'll tell you what's coming. Also, what's coming up. Uh, yeah, that's where you can subscribe for uh, for this program, or go to the events page at, at TexasAsphalt.org and click on Everyday Asphalt and sign up for the next one, which will be next month. And again, we hold these on the third Thursday at three o'clock. And uh, and also uh, check us out on Spotify. We'll be up there uh, shortly as well. So, uh, Bill, thank you so much for. Uh, for being part of this program and uh, I wish everybody uh, be safe out there keep making good asphalt and uh, ever forward everybody bye bye now